Good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Good to see everyone that's able to come out and be with us. And uh, glad they finally let Andy out. Um, didn't know if he was going to keep him or not. And uh, thankful for the prayers the Lord answered concerning him. And we want to, uh, those that's tuning in by live stream, we want to welcome you to our service tonight and join in and be a part of it. Uh, we appreciate all the feedback and all of the prayers that uh, goes out for this church and for our pastor greatly appreciated and uh, and we do care about you and we appreciate you tuning in i stand up take the church hymnal and turn to page number 181 i thought i'd try we'd try this brand new song out tonight page 181 
standing turn to page number 382 382 I would not be denied soul that's with us. I want you to make yourself right at home. It's good to have Andy back. He's had a bout and had some horrible pain. God brought him through it. It's good to have Lucas back. He's been all over the country preaching the word. Been in a lot of different churches. Learned a lot about how churches differ. And boy, do they ever differ. And we're glad to have him back with us tonight. He did say something that I know, and I think most of you know. Tennessee is a pretty state. Yeah, it is. East Tennessee, you get up here in these mountains, western North Carolina, same thing. And a lot of beauty, the Appalachians. And we thank God for it. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn with me tonight to the book of uh, John, chapter number 17. We're going to talk about the prayer life of our Lord Jesus Christ tonight. John, chapter 17, and verse number 5. Scripture says, And thou, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which, note carefully, I had with thee before the world was. 
Verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Father, bless your word now. Your holy name, amen. It'd be amazing to do a little study on what all was done before the foundation of the world. Amen. You'd be surprised. The Lord Jesus Christ, my father, uh, folks, is the second person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. He has forever existed, folks. There was never, ever a beginning of time with him. But the God-man started 2,000 years ago when God ordained and, and, uh, and, and uh, incarnated himself into human flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ had full communion with the Father before he ever was brought into this world and uh, incarnate in flesh. There was full communion. He's what he's talking about. The glory that I had with thee before the world was. I want you to think about this for a moment now. The Lord Jesus Christ was a sinless person. Sinless. Never did he ever sin. From the moment that he came into this world until he left it, no sin. And yet, he prayed and wanted fellowship with the Father. Now think about that. Think about that. That's something to think about. Uh, there are those who think that the only way, uh, you know, the only reason to pray and have fellowship with the Father is to get forgiveness of sin. Well, that's part of it, but that's, that's, that's not necessarily the point. The point is that you have fellowship, sustenance from the Father. The Lord Jesus depended upon the Father. He was in complete and total dependence upon him. My, he, would he would find a time and a place to get away from the people. Uh, he had to get away from them. He couldn't stay with them all the time. There had to be a time when he got alone with God. And there's nothing that can replace that. There's nothing that can take its place. Every one of us tonight, we need a time when we get alone with God. He got alone in prayer. The Lord Jesus Christ prayed, folks, sometimes all night long. Here are some of the things in Scripture that record when he prayed. Luke chapter number 3 and verse 21, he prayed before his baptism. When all the people baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. He's praying. All right. Now, this is communication of a man with God. Remember, there's not a word in that Bible from Genesis to Revelation that ever says an angel or a cherubim or a seraphim, any of these creatures, watchers or what have you, ever pray. But the man has that great privilege and blessing. And the Lord Jesus Christ never prayed until he became a man. Then once he became a man, prayer started. Communication with God. In Luke chapter number 6 and verse 12, before the election of the 12, he prayed. The Bible says, it came to pass in those days he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Now that takes some discipline and it takes some grace to be able to do that. That's quite a thing. It's been done and uh, in the past, and I'm sure probably right now. There are people that are doing that, and you have to have the physical uh, stamina and the spiritual desire to be able to pray all night long. But I'll tell you one thing, uh, it happens, and there is a reward for it. But make no mistake about it, he would pray all night in prayer. Now, if a sinless, perfect man needed to pray all night long, to find the will of God in his life. Who am I tonight? I mean, good night. I am not sinless and I am not perfect. So he prayed before he elected, chose the 12. Now consider this. He said, of the 12 that I've chosen, one of you is a devil. And he prayed all night and still he chose Judas Iscariot, which is an enigma, folks. Judas is not easy to figure out. I know he's a thief. I know he carried the bag. I know he fulfilled the prophecy in the Old Testament. But there's still an element about Judas Iscariot that's not easy to get hold of. In, before the, at the discourse in the synagogue at Capernaum, Matthew chapter 14, he prayed. The scripture says, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea, walking on the water. And he had been praying. You suppose he might have known what was coming? I think he did. I think he did. I believe he got it from the power of the Holy Spirit of God. 
uh, when the, uh, anytime he needed to make a decision, a choice, some kind of a thing that's so very important about his life, he prayed. Luke chapter 5, verse 15, but so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself in the, into the wilderness and prayed. Now you have to look a little deeper into this. A lot of people today think he's a miracle worker. They think he's a great prophet. They think he was a man who came and, and fulfilled his ministry 2,000 years ago and we should have great respect and honor for him. And that's all they know. And this was the problem 2,000 years ago. He wanted them to understand that there's far more to him than a miracle worker. Amen. Far more. Far more. They say he was a prophet. Absolutely he was a prophet fulfilling the prophecy that Moses gave. But he's far more than just a prophet. The Lord Jesus Christ, my dear friend, has an identity that only the Father can put in your soul. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some uh, Moses, some Elias, some Jeremiah, some one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? This is what's going on here. And the Apostle Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Mashiach, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Do you know him tonight as God Almighty manifest in the flesh? If you really know him in that identity, you didn't get that from men. You got that from God, and that's what's important. In the book of Luke chapter number 9, he told his disciples what he was about to do. He told them what was going to happen. Luke chapter 9, verse 18, it came to pass. He was alone praying. See the praying? His disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist. Some say Elias. Others say that one of the prophets is risen again. He said to them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. He straightly charged them. Now watch this. And commanded them to tell no man that saying, that thing saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. This is the hardest thing for the Jews to accept is how he was taken and crucified. How could the Messiah die on a cross, you see? And I've told you many times that the Jewish sages, those who the Jewish teachers teach that there are uh, uh, two messiahs. There's a suffering messiah and a reigning messiah. Mashiach ben David was his messiah, the son of David, and Mashiach ben Joseph, the son of Joseph. Which one of those two would you think would be the suffering messiah, the son of Joseph or the son of David? Joseph, of course. That's how they reconcile the sufferings of Christ with his messianic credentials. You see? You hear it taught, and I, I had it taught to me in Sunday school as I grew up, that the Jews were looking for someone who could deliver them from Roman bondage, right? A deliverer for someone who could restore the kingdom to Israel. Without this time, restore the kingdom, Acts chapter 1. That's what they were looking for, and they leave it at that. Well, that's only partially true. It is true, but that's only partially true. There's a whole lot more going on than simply that. Who is this man? It's not about a kingdom, it's about the man. You see, in order for him to suffer and die, or not Christ to suffer and then rise again the third day, that's what he said to the two on the road to Emmaus, who there, at that time, contemporaries with the history, didn't have it right. And he explained it to them. He must suffer. Well, that's Mashiach ben Joseph. And then he comes back as Messiah, the son of David because David is the only king that Israel ever had that pulled all the tribes together, and God says he will have one sitting on his throne in perpetuity, and I will give him the sure mercies of David. David was different, unlike any other king. He called him from the sheep coat and made him the king of Israel. Now in the book of Luke chapter number nine, before his transfiguration came to pass about eight days after these sayings, what's the number eight in the Bible? You know, a lot of folks, they, you know, they don't like gematria. They run it down. They say you're getting, you're getting off into witchcraft or something of that nature. Now, my dear friend, why is the Bible so certain about certain days? Forty days, forty days, forty days. See, forty days. Forty days he was in the field. Forty years they wandered in the wilderness. Forty is the number of testing, right? 
Seven, completion, completion, completion. What's the number eight? New beginning, new beginning, new beginning. You take the name Jesus, which we get Jesus from. The gematria of that name is eight, eight, eight. That's not a coincidence. That's by design. And notice carefully what it says here. It says, and it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, his raiment was white and glistening, and behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. Now, how would they have known that it was Moses and Elias? How, how would they have known the identity? They had no photographs, and they certainly didn't have any graven images carving their image. Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem? So he prayed before this transfiguration. And what's happening here? This is God beginning to mark his son out as infinitely superior to anything that had ever walked this earth before. You don't compare Christ to Moses. You don't compare Christ to Enoch. You don't compare Christ with any man. Why? The man is not big enough to be compared with him. You compare Christ with God if you want to compare him with someone. <laughs> And so uh, he prayed before his transfiguration. In the book of Luke chapter 22, as he approached the cross at Gethsemane, here's what it says, Luke 22, verse 44. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat was it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray lest ye enter into temptation. You see, Peter put more trust in his sword strapped to his side than he did prayer, which was the true weapon. There may be a time you need a sword, but my dear friend, prayer cannot be substituted. There's no substitute for it. Prayer is a blessing and a gift that's given to us, folks. It's ours. We're men, mankind. And prayer is one of the great blessings from God that allows us through prayer to be able to approach to the Almighty. Now on three occasions, there was a voice that came from heaven, the Father speaking about his Son. Three times, God spoke from heaven. In the book of Matthew chapter number three, verse 16, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here is the Trinity, right here at the Jordan River. You have the Trinity in unity. In plain words, this is how the work is done. It originates from the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, with Christ doing it, all right? From the Father through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The Scripture says that God did not give the Spirit by measure to Him, all right? But He does us. Because I'm only I'm only capable of, of 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 having so much of fullness of the God of the Godhead only so much of it, and uh, but here note carefully now, at his baptism, the Spirit of God comes down. So what happens to Christ at his baptism? What's so important about the baptism? Well, when the Holy Ghost came down, God anointed him. All right. Now let me show you how important that anointing is. Look at the book of Exodus, chapter number thirty-one, and verse one. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 1. And here I'm afraid a lot of my good Baptist brethren, they get real nervous when you get around something like this. But folks, this is scripture. In, Luke, in, in Exodus chapter 31 verse 1, the Lord spake to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezaliel, all right? Bezaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and all manner of workmanship. So what are we talking about here? You'll see as we continue to read. To devise cunning works, to work in gold and silver and brass, in cutting of stones, to set them, and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahishamach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom. Now look at this carefully. That they may make all that I have commanded thee. Make what? Verse 7. 
the tabernacle of the congregation, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table, the furniture, the pure candlestick with all his furniture, altar of incense, altar of burnt offerings, with all his furniture, the labor in his foot, the cloths of service, the holy garments of Aaron the priest, the garments of his son, sons to minister in the priest's office, and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, shall they do. That's heavy duty stuff I just read for you. Okay? Because what we are making are the most holy objects on the face of the earth at that time. So holy that when that ark began to shake, Uzzah put his hand up. What happened to him? So what is the difference between Uzzah, who touched the ark and died instantly, and Belize and, uh, and uh, Bezaliel, who made it? See? I'm forcing you to think tonight. What's the difference? Same ark. One dies when he touches it. The other one made it. Both were men. What happened? Well, what happened is this. Once that ark was anointed, then it became holy. What does that mean? Separate unto God. That's what holiness is. It, righteousness, morality, and all that is associated and attached to it. That's fine and well and good, but that's not the basic meaning. The meaning is that that ark is so separated unto God that to touch it is to approach into the presence of God and to offend His holiness. That's what that means. That's what that means. Now, you, I've told you a thousand times that light is a very important thing. Light is a very powerful thing. Do you remember when the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines? Do you remember that? They carried it off into their cities and uh, poor, uh, poor Dagon <laughs> set the Ark of God before this, before this idol and Dagon didn't do too well, did he? Well, here's bottom line. They put that on a cart, got rid of it. They said, we don't want this thing. This is, this is causing us too much trouble, and sent it back, all right? And the ark, pull, the ark was on a cart. God didn't tell them to move it like that, but they didn't know that. They're ignorant. They're ignorant pagans. They are not sinning against light. They have no knowledge. The ark is still holy unto God, all right? Once you are introduced to the holiness of God, and understand what that holiness is and what it means, then you're accountable. You follow me? So the ark comes back and it crosses the line and Beth Shemesh, house of the sun. Israelis went down and they looked into it and they died by the tens of thousands. Why? Because they were violating the light and the holiness that they knew. Okay? That ark was anointed. It was anointed unto God. And so, a principle begins to develop before us tonight. And what is that? The Lord Jesus Christ was a sinless man. He grew up in the home of a carpenter. But when the Holy Ghost came down upon him and anointed him, it didn't make him sinless. He was already sinless. It didn't have anything to do with sin. It had to do with anointing. It had to do with separating him into the holiness of God. To defile him is to defile God. To, 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 to refuse to accept his, who, the, idea, the knowledge of who he is is to reject every revelation that God ever gave about Christ. That's what that means. That means that we are in a place tonight, and I especially as a minister, as a, as a bishop of a church, am accountable. Why? Because I've got the light. I'm accountable because I know what holiness is. I'm accountable because I know what the Bible is. I know what the gospel of Christ is. I'm accountable unto God, folks. It's not like jerking wheels off of a car and doing a brake job, jerk a motor out and do a valve job. It's not building a house and nailing boards together, uh, shaping concrete or anything like that, teaching a class. No. I deal with the souls of men. I'm accountable to God. He says, take the oversight thereof. Right. Right. Take that oversight, Acts chapter number 20. That's not a simple thing. In order for you to step into this and to dare to do that, you better get a call from God. 
And that's what the call is about. That's why I firmly believe in it. I believe in the call to preach. When God saved me in 1973, I didn't think about preaching. Huh. Good night, man. That's the last thing in my mind. Preaching. But then something began to move in my soul. Something began to move. And that was a long time ago. I answered the call. God's blessed it. God has blessed me greatly for 47 years. God has taken care of me and he has blessed me. And this is because of the call. This man sitting on the front row. You've been called. You've been anointed. You've been separated. An ordained bishop minister of the gospel of Christ. Right now, he's not so much a bishop as he is an ordained minister. He's an elder. Peter called himself an elder. But a bishop is one who has to do with, the, with, with his relationship to a church. It doesn't make him any more of a, of a, of a minister or, 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 or an elder. But that's the bishop. The bishop is the one who's the overseer of the church, accountable to God. This is why Paul said in the book of Hebrews, I must give an account. Now think about this tonight. Are you Uzzah? Are you uh, Bezalel? Or are you the ignorant Philistine? Have you ever noticed how that the unbeliever a lot of times gets away with things? He does it because he's ignorant. He's not violating his light. He's not violating the light. He's not, he's, not, he's not grieving the Holy Spirit. He's not committing the sin unto death. And he is not blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Right. I, this is kind of stuff here that you take this stuff I'm giving you tonight, take it home and think over what I'm saying to you. But if you've been in the church of God and you know, yeah, and you know, and you know, and you know that you know, and you've seen it, you've experienced it, and you know the power of God, and you know the power of the Holy Spirit, you know the presence of the Lord, you know what's holy unto God, and all these things, then you better be careful. You better be careful, because you're accountable then. And this is what it's about. When God spoke from heaven, he said, this is my son. And the Holy Ghost came down, and the apostle says, and we know that Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with the Holy Ghost of God, and he was set apart unto the work of the Lord. This is why it says in the Old Testament, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. And it's a great blessing when the church understands that and accepts that responsibility, and it's a great blessing for the people and for the individual. So, a man made it, but if he had touched that later, he would have died in his tracks. Bezalel, who made that ark, would have dropped dead after it was anointed. Now, there was a group that could handle the ark. How many of you know the, enough of your Bible history to know somebody had to put, take the tent down, put it together, prepare it, and to move it? Who was that? That's the Levi and the Kohath and Merari. Right. Those two tribes were responsible. That's what they did. They moved the ark. And then the others were the priests. They were the ones who ministered in the temple. And then, of course, at this time, it's the tabernacle. And then, of course, Aaron and his successor would be the high priest who could go one time a year into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God. And I, supp I suspect, I, I strongly suspect that when Aaron, when Aaron went back into that Holy of Holies, he walked softly. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I do. I believe he walked softly. You remember he lost two sons. How many of you remember that? Do you remember their names? I know you didn't think you were going to get a quiz tonight, but you won't. He had two sons. What were their names? That's right. Somebody said it. Nadab and Abihu. And that's tough, wasn't it? He lost his two sons. Nadab and Abihu. If that did not drive home to him the importance of the holiness of God, holy unto the Lord, separate unto God, then nothing, nothing could. And so, of course, it did. And so Aaron lived out his days. Now we read in the book of Exodus, chapter number 30, verse 26, Thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony. And then, of course, all the other things, along with Aaron, he was anointed, and his sons were anointed. And you remember what it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 6, A king, folks, Uzziah, a king, the king of Israel, a king went into the holy place and burned incense. And they told him, they said, don't you do this. You may be the king, but there's one bigger than you. There is the king of kings and lord of lords. Don't do it. And he pushed them aside and went in there. And the Bible says that the leprosy filled his face right in front of them immediately. 
and he lived out as a leper for the rest of his life, and then he died. And the year that King Uzziah died, it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 6, that Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train did fill the temple. What's that? That's comparing the holiness and glory of God to a leprous king who rejected the holiness of Almighty God. So Matthew chapter 17, the transfiguration. While he yet spake, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice said, This is my beloved Son. I am well pleased in whom I am well pleased. And the third time that God spoke from heaven about the Lord Jesus is found in John chapter number 12, verse 27. The Lord says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And the glory of God, uh, a lot of people think it's just a cloud, folks. That cloud is just a, a very small part of the glory of God. The glory of God goes much deeper than something you can see with your natural eyes. And they could see the cloud with their natural eyes in the daytime. And they could see the fire at night with a natural eye. But the glory of God goes much, much deeper than that. So he prayed. He was anointed. He was set apart. And when, they t and when they nailed him to the cross, here's what he had to say about these tormentors and those that nailed him. He said, Father, forgive them. Based on what? What did he say? For they what? They don't know what they're doing. They're not sinning against knowledge. They're not sinning against the Holy Spirit. They're not blaspheming the Holy Ghost. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. And the Apostle Paul says, I received forgiveness. I was forgiven because what I did, he said, I did it ignorantly in what? Unbelief. Unbelief. Even though he was set at the feet of Gamaliel, well versed in his religion, in other words, well educated. He knew far more than Peter did. Peter was a fisherman. The Apostle Paul was trained. Yet he said, having said at the feet of Gamaliel, all that I'd been through, he said, I still did it ignorantly in unbelief. But on the road to Damascus, when the Holy Ghost came to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am who? I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. And he astonished and trembling. And I would have been too, wouldn't you? Yes, he was. Astonished and trembling. So when I go home tonight, I will always remember until I draw the last breath in this body that I am not allowed to go to some of the places you can go to. I am not allowed to read some of the things that you read. I am not allowed to see some of the things that you see. I am not allowed to do that, and I know I'm not. I have a barrier about me that, that, that a lot of, most other people don't have. I don't, it's not a grievance to me, not one bit. Not, it's not a grievance at all. His, uh, serving the Lord is a blessing. It always has been. Until I leave this world, it will be, and that's my greatest prayer that God allows me to have my faculties, my mental faculties, my mind. If I can just think, I'll be happy. And you may have to roll me around on a gurney or whatever, but if I can think, I'll be happy. But if I lose my mind, I won't be out of here. I don't want to sit around as a vegetable somewhere. I want, I want God to use me until my time's up. Amen. And that would be the greatest blessing in the world. So I know whom I have believed, and I know who laid his hand upon me and called me to preach. I know the anointing that God puts upon our soul. And any of you brethren out there, and you may be watching me online right now, and you identify fully with what I just said, and you know it. And you may have been discouraged, and you may have quit and gone off somewhere, and you and said to yourself, well, I tried. No, there's no trying to it. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. If he called you, he called you. Yeah, right? You may not be qualified to pastor, but you certainly can preach. And as the old timer used to say one time, and I've heard it said, and I thought it was real good, said, preach the word. Preach it. And if you have to, use words. The pastor lives in a fishbowl and a pressure cooker. 
and I'm used to it. <laughs> That's my calling. That's who I am, and I am blessed tonight. I am not complaining. Father, bless your word. Thank you for what you've done for us. I need to pray more, Lord. I confess that freely to you in a heartbeat. I need to pray more. I need to pray more. I can't pray too much. I know that. I cannot pray too much, and I need to pray more. Thank you, Lord. You've been good to me. In your holy name I pray. Amen. God bless you, folks. We'll take your prayer request tonight. Debbie's going to sing for us here in a minute, but we'll wait till we get to, at the end of the service. We'll let her sing tonight. We have any prayer requests tonight? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I figured uh, they're not here. Uh, uh, Jean texted me um, before I came and said that they have uh, put her on hospice care um, and that uh, she was very excited about it, actually. She said the doctors and nurses are going to be coming to her except for the oncology appointment she has to go to. But they found that out today so all right amen remember a neighbor of ours uh, they have a 23 had a 23 year old son he's in military and he took his own life a few days ago all right anybody else I'm going to be traveling to Kentucky Saturday um, to go to correctional facility and teach and I just covet your prayers for um, traveling mercies and I'm really struggling getting the lesson together that God wants me to to teach and so I appreciate prayers right. for that as well. Okay. Yeah. We'll pray for you. That'd be a good trip. Yes, it will. Uh, Brother Mike Connery uh, texted me today and asked me to request prayer for him. He's uh, got some uh, skin cancer on his face and uh, he's gone to the doctor today to get some of that taken care of. So just remember him in prayer, please. All right. I would like for you to remember my father. Um, he got diagnosed with cancer and don't know how bad it is yet. Um, I prayed for him for years and years and years uh, to be saved, and he is saved. Um, he got saved about 10 years ago, and so I'm really thankful for that. And um, I'm thankful for answered prayer for Eddie, and the test came back good. Good. And so uh, good. thankful for answered prayer. Good. Good. They were worried he might have leukemia. Been praying for him, and I'm sure many of you have. Anybody else? Just please remember, uh, Sister Peacock, once again, um, I was told that she was given a year uh, with chemo, and so uh, just pray for her and that uh, God would touch her and heal her. Like I said, this is the third bout she's had. And then pray for us Friday as we go down to CARM. Um, sometimes it's, sometimes we don't have as much liberty as other times to, to witness those folks. That's a, that's a different ministry. It's the end of the road for a lot of those people. Um, so just pray that God would give us what we need to say to them and wisdom. Thank you. Amen. I've got a praise report. My mom's tests came back and everything's good and she's healthy and I thank the Lord for that. And um, I just want to thank the Lord for the opportunities he's given me publicly. God's been good to me, and I don't deserve anything he's done for me. But he's been good. I love my church. I love my pastor. And I get texts from some of y'all telling me you're praying for me, and I covet your prayers. I love y'all. I'm thankful. Amen. Well, I want to praise God for Pastor Lawson. We, uh, we've been watching you online for a year or better now, and God opened the door and made a way for us to come up here and get to listen to you this evening, and we thank him for that. And Lord just has so richly blessed us. I mean, we don't, we don't deserve the life we've lived. And, you know, you've been a, your service and your, you know, 
just hearing you, is we're kind of like in a, we tell, we're like in a spiritual desert where we are, we're in the middle of nowhere in Florida, and, but you're a real light coming through, and you know, just the spirit coming through, and we just thank you and praise Amen. God for you and the opportunity to be here. Well, good to have you. Now, where, where, where y'all from in Florida? Fort White. Fort White? Fort White. All yep. right. That's Enjoy. what everybody says. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. It's uh, 45 minutes northwest of Gainesville. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, good to have you. Just thank you. Yes. All right. Lucas, would you lead us in prayer tonight? sing for us tonight. Don't forget now, Bible school is coming up. The, uh, what's the date on it? 24th. I knew it was down in there. All right. Today I faced a mountain once again, it seems so tall. I tried to climb it, but it seemed I'd surely fall. So I knelt and I called on Jesus, just as always I felt his presence, his hand of mercy, it lifted me just in time. And I want to thank him, and I want to praise him. His grace has been sufficient, and like before, He's given victory one more time. He was always standing by my side when the room valley was low and the river was wide. And I want to thank him and I to praise him one more time. Looking back on this journey since the day that I first met him, so many times his love and mercy rescued me. So once again, I'll come before Him. One more time, I'll stand and praise Him. For all His blessings, yes, He has been so good to me. And I want to thank Him. And I want to praise Him. His grace has been sufficient. And like before, He's given victory one more time.
time and he was always standing by my side when the valley was low and the river was wide and I want to thank him and I want to praise him one more time is yes, I want to thank him and I want to praise him one more time that's good amen well thank you for coming we'll meet again Sunday Lord willing if we're here and I hope we're not. I hope we're gone. Amen. Amen. That's the blessed hope. There's nothing greater than that. Lord, come back. You may come back tonight. Remember, Jerusalem is seven hours ahead of us. So when the sun rises at what about six o'clock, six thirty, somewhere in there, uh, that's uh, it'll be it'll be eleven, six thirty there, it'll be eleven thirty here. Amen. You'll be going to bed when the sun's coming up. The Lord comes back and gets us. Amen. You miss a night's sleep. Wouldn't it be awful? Let's stand up. We'll let you go. Father, thank you for coming to your house and time we've had together. Bless these dear folk and keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.